This is Wenatchee, Washington on a very hot summer day in the Columbia River. Today we visit another geologist. We go to the backyard of longtime USGS geologist Ralph Hagerud to talk about the North Cascades. He's got multiple decades of experience working and thinking about those rocks. Baja BC and other things as well. Thanks for joining us. Over to Ralph's house we go. Has it been a smooth process with the new house? <laughs> hell the hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you now with the proceedings? Um, uh, we're beginning to install floors, flooring. Okay. The, the painting got done uh, over the weekend. Well, you're here in Wenatchee, but you lived most of your career in Seattle. Why the switch recently here? Um, it's a pre-retirement move, yeah. and I wanted to retire someplace so I could ride the city bus to the ski hill, and Wenatchee is one of those. And, and my here? wife is really happy to be here. Oh, good, good, good. Um, now, have you been affiliated with the U.S. Geological Survey your entire career or a portion of it? Almost my entire career. Um, I spent uh, a little bit of time as a consultant, uh, you know, contract work mapping a dam site for City Light, oh. um, and six months or so working for a geothermal exploration firm. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, I've been a grad student and a postdoc and a survey employee. <laughs> well, let's get into that training. So, a uh, grad student at the University of Washington? And before that, I was a master's student at Western Washington University, where I was also an undergraduate. Okay. So, did you grow up in Washington? I'm a Seattle native. Seattle native. Okay. So you got into geology up at Western. Uh, who were your advisors at Western? What kind of work were you doing as a student? Um, fall quarter my freshman year on a lark because a counselor told me I liked the course. I enrolled in Ned Brown's physical geology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could sit in the dark and look at pictures of mountains. And the tests were multiple choice and easy to get. <laughs> the only hard part was mineral chemistry. And I had been in really into pottery in high school, and I knew the chemical formula for a feldspar. So I got an A. <laughs> <laughs> and what year was that? That would have been the fall of 1970. Fall of 70, and, um, and Ned Brown is, was doing work in the North Cascades at that time? Yeah. Ned Brown was in the North Cascades. I went on to take more geology because I enjoyed it. Um, when it came time that you've got to choose a major, well, I had almost enough credits in geology, so I chose that. And I should say, the person I took the most influential courses from was Merle Beck. Oh, and when oh. I asked to go on to master's work at the department, the department was surprised I wanted to work with Ned. They had me tagged for a geophysicist to be. But I wanted to look at rocks Wow! and, and make maps. So this is the early 70s, and yeah. Merle is just coming out with these papers. And he's trying to get you into the paleomag lab, or you already were doing a little bit of the paleomag stuff? No, he just taught interesting courses in geophysics and, uh -huh. and geotectonics. And the geotectonics was a lark. Um, we had a, a really amazing group of students, and we read, I think it was a book edited by Alan Cox on plate tectonics and geophysics, and talked about the papers. Um, but, you know, taking the geophysics course, uh, Merle had us all out on an outcrop holding a chainsaw, making little round pieces of rock. And, uh, um, you know, it, it was very engaging intellectually. But you but, say you wanted to look at rocks, and so was that your master's work then, doing a kind of a traditional field mapping project? Yeah, I went to an area east of Baker Lake, so south of Mount Shucks and southeast of Mount Baker, okay. and looked at the Shucks and Metamorphic Suite and the Shucks and Thrust, which I went camping, I collected samples, I looked at lots and lots of road cuts um, and came back and, and looked at thin sections and wrote a story. So this is still the early 70s, and can mm -hmm. you give us a sense of, of what was known regionally or locally with shucks and let's say in that era? Um, Plate tectonics is just starting to become accepted. Yeah, and, and Ned had bought into plate tectonics, um, and Ned had also had worked on rocks like the Shucks and was very intrigued by them and was r running a campaign of his own work and students' work on the Shucks and I was part of that. Okay. Um, Ned had not cleared this with Peter Mish 
and that was a source of some friction with Peter. Uh -huh. But that didn't matter to me. I wasn't at the University of Washington. You weren't at the time. At the time. Yeah. Um, and so I was just happy to go look at pretty rocks out in the mountains and, and didn't think a lot about it. I was, and then and still I'm interested in how the earth moves. I mean, the part of geology that most intrigues me is that the earth changes shape with time. Yeah. And as geologists, we can see that. And, and so I consider myself fundamentally a structural geologist. Not a very good one, but that's the part that oh, intrigues sorry. me the most. And, and so I wanted to see how the shucks and thrust worked. Now, and I, I learned nothing about that in my master's <laughs> thesis, but that was the goal I had going in, was to, how do big thrust sheets work? What are the mechanics like? What do you see on the outcrop that lets you know how these work? And um, I think the shucks and thrust, we still don't understand that very well. Oh, interesting. Um, so you continue you leave Western, you go to the University of Washington for a PhD right away? Uh, let me back up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched your interviews with, with, with Merle, yeah. and I should point out that my TA in that physical geology course in the fall of 1970 was Linda Lawrence. Oh, it's all coming around. <laughs> it, it's now. a very small world. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, let's not leave that then. Was it, was it a, uh, a celeb? Well, let's see. Merle pretty quickly, it feels like, became a controversial figure. When you were at Western, were you aware of Merle publishing on Baja BC or these, these strange inclinations in, in the Mount Stewart Basilisk? I don't, not really. Um, I think I was sort of knew about it, but it didn't come to the fore until I got to the University of Washington okay. and began working um, with Daryl. He was my PhD supervisor. Oh, um, really? On terrain tectonics in the North Cascades. Well, let's get there. Okay, so you, you come down to Seattle and you've got a taste of the North Cascades academically, and maybe mm -hmm. you are, you're recreating up there too, and it's part of your life. Mm -hmm. And so it was a no brainer for you to continue with North Cascades geology? Yeah, I came to the U because I could work on the North Cascades there, and Daryl was willing to sponsor me. And um, I walked, and I came to the U. As a Ned Brown student, okay. very aware of the, uh, the enmity between him and Peter Mish over geology North Cascades. Wow. And I knew it was okay to come to the U in 1980 because Peter had just retired. And so I was safe. And I walked into Daryl's office, you know, first week of fall quarter and said, I want to work in the North Cascades. He said, great, Peter's on your committee. <laughs> And, and, and the, the person I spent the most time with on the faculty in Seattle was Peter Mish. You're maybe the best then to tell us about him. His name keeps coming up. I know very little about Peter Mish. Oh, can you, can you kind of give us a, a short version of, of who he was and why he was at odds with everyone it appeared to be? Peter was German born, um, apparently very precocious and bright. He got his PhD in his early 20s. Okay. His father, and, and this is, some of this is hearsay, I may not be getting it right. His right. father was a philosophy professor at Göttingen, I'm not sure. Okay. And Peter went there as a student and studied under Hans Stilla, I believe, did his PhD in the Pyrenees. He was also a fairly strong mountaineer. And he went to the Himalaya with Willie Merkel's Nanga Parbat expedition as the expedition geologist. Oh and um, came back to Germany, um, did a postdoc, oh come, my names are failing me, no, with a fine. famous geochemist um, who will come back to me later. Yeah. Um, and then was apparently told by the powers that be that in the late 30s that someone else with pure blood needs to work on your Nanga Parbat samples. And Peter's family was Jewish. He was a, a avowed atheist, not religious at all, but his family was Jewish and, and he was not appropriate to work on these important rocks in the huh. 1939 Germany. Wow. And he spent the war years, World War II, in China, teaching at Sun Yat-sen's National University. And uh, it's worth digging into his first U.S. papers written in 1949, American Journal of Science. There's a series on uh, granitization. And um, he, he mentions, you know, outcrops in southwestern China that he couldn't get to because the, his guide said there were too many bandits. <laughs> so this is during the war. He's doing geology in Yunnan. Um, wow. And he came to the U.S. after the war, uh, spent a couple of years at Stanford, I believe, and then was hired at the University of Washington um, 
by George Goodspeed, who was also a granitizer, a soak. Huh. They, they didn't believe in the magmatic origin of granites, that they were metamorphic rocks. Um, huh. And Peter, I think, was in Seattle from 1949 on. And um, So was Peter kind of territorial as far as the North Cascades? Peter was very territorial, and he was, you know, despite the fact that um, he had no love for things German and, and, and Germany. Yeah. Um, he was very much the archetypical German professor. He was Herr Dr. Professor Misch, mm. and, um, and he had his own mountain range. In fact, he had four of them. You know, he owned a piece of the Pyrenees, he owned Nanga Parbat, he owned big chunks of northeastern Nevada, and he owned the North Cascades. <laughs> and you work in those at his pleasure. <laughs> so this guy was on your committee? Yeah. Now, the other thing is, he was, Peter was very influential. Um, Apparently in the late 50s or mid 50s, uh, Congress changed oil tax laws and oil, tax, oil exploration shut down in the US. And many of the major oil companies fired their exploration firms and there were no jobs for geologists. Mm -hmm. And many graduate programs contracted severely as a result. And the University of Washington is one of the very few that didn't. And so Peter was turning out PhDs throughout the late 50s when no one else was and he had students everywhere. Mm. Um, and Let's do a bit more with that, actually. Yeah. So, so he's got. It's really his group that's that's doing the lion's share of mapping in the North Cascades in nineteen fifties and even the sixties. Fifties and sixties, North Cascades work is almost entirely Peter Misch's students. Hmm. Um, and what was their approach? Were they going region by region? Or was there some goal to just map the whole North Cascades at a certain scale? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I don't know how focused it was. Clearly, this, the theses were postage stamps that you know adjoined each other, yeah. um, and actually, a couple of them are not his students. Okay. There were other students yeah. involved, other advisors involved. Mm -hmm. um, in retrospect, what amazes me is is mapping was not the primary focus of hardly any of those theses. Really, um, and. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm dragging the conversation places You're that fine. I want to go. You're fine. But the North Cascades are a very hard place to map. Um, between the inaccessibility and the vegetation, um, there's just not that much outcrop you can actually look at. And so Peter's students' work in the North Cascades was almost entirely petrologic. They collected samples and looked at thin sections. I see. And, and, and the North Cascades for years have been a place where if you can't say leucotrongemite, you can't work. <laughs> because they're a petrographer's mountains. Um, and Peter knew how to map, and his students mapped, but the mapping was done in northeastern Nevada, um, in the Snake Range, in the Rubies, and, okay. and, 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 and those places. So you start working on your PhD. Was that a mapping project? I wanted it to be a mapping project, um, but most of what I learned was from looking at thin sections. Wow. Um, or, or analyzing samples in various ways. And what was the title of your dissertation? I was <laughs> <laughs> Geology of the Hosamine Group and the Ross Lake Fault Zone in the Massapanic Creek Area, Southwestern British Columbia. Okay. And so basically the, the, the northwest corner of Ross Lake. Okay. Mostly sampling, analyzing back in the lab, that sort of thing. Yeah, trying to do what I could understand the Ross Lake Fault Zone. And yeah. so I, I and did a bit more than that. I collected chertz out of the hosamine and, and dissolved in hydrofluoric acid and sent the samples out to Chuck Blome and learned that the hosamine is Permian and Triassic and, and early Jurassic. Okay. Um, collected greenstones and made thin sections and analyzed the pyroxenes and found out that mostly they're um, oceanic island basalts. Huh. Um, looked at outcrops and much of the hosamine is chaotic. And uh, it reminded me of the Dr. Seuss book, uh, oh, McGilligot's Pool, where, <laughs> where, where there's a fish that slides down the sides of strange islands on skis, which reinforced for me that um, landslide processes are, are like avalanches. And avalanches, I know landslides, I didn't at the time. And at, this was about the time we were learning that Hawaii was ringed by humongous landslides. Mm -hmm. And I realized that much of the hosing was probably these deposits, these big oh, submarine wow. landslides, because it was mixed shallow water and deep water rocks. So a little uh, break here to, to let you know where we're heading here. We're enjoying some scones and some wonderful coffee here in, uh, in Ralph's um, back patio. 
And if you're like, okay, I think I know this guy. How do I know this guy? You might know about this. Roland Tabor and Ralph Hagerud created this beautiful publication that I've been using for at least a decade. And it's an amazing summary of much of the work that's been done in the North Cascades. And so we're talking with Ralph here, who has not only been kind of in on the ground floor, but also having the ability to pull back and communicate this to a general audience with this publication from the Mountaineers, or these amazing field guides that Ralph helped edit and wrote one of my favorite summaries from 1994's Seattle Geological Society of America meeting. And Ralph is pretty much getting everybody up to speed in the mid-90s about what we know and what we still don't know about these terrains, including field guides as well. And before I just forget about it, as recently as a decade ago, 2009, Ralph and Roland uh, putting together an amazing, um, well, I'll let you describe this one, Ralph. Let's jump ahead just briefly to this 2009 mm -hmm. map. What was the, was that kind of what it appears to be, which is kind of like, okay, we've been at this a few decades, kind of this is what we know, and here's the map to show the entire North Cascades in one big hunk. Yeah, it, it's, it's a summary of two careers, much more Roland's than mine. Okay. But Roland uh, did his dissertation under Peter Mish also in the North Cascades. Wow. And um, started work, I believe, in the l mid or late 70s, mapping the North Cascades at 100,000 scale. Um, initially for reactor safety concerns, um, huh. because there was a thought of putting reactors in the Columbia, and we okay. need to know what the earthquake hazard is, which means we need to know the geology. Mm -hmm. And also as sort of, you know, bedrock's important because we might find copper and gold in it, so let's get a better sense of bedrock geology. And he began a program of mapping the North Cascades at 100,000 scale, so uh, half inch to the mile. Um, this is Roland Tabor we're yeah, talking about. Yeah, and began um, in the Wenatchee area with the Wenatchee Quadrangle and proceeded to march through the, the eight quadrangles of the North Cascades. Um, summarizing, compiling previous geology and doing the field work and the dating, the analyses to tie it all together. And it's an amazing body of work because it's um, six plus quadrangles, yes. or actually probably seven and a half quadrangles, all with the same set of eyes bringing it together. And the North Cascades are probably as complicated a piece of bedrock geology as any place on the planet. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> say this is, you know, most of Roland's career, he worked other places also, but it's where he spent the most of his time, and much of mine. And this was uh, a synthesis and summary. Um, well, let's, so, so that's where we're headed with this interview, mm -hmm. kind of, but, but we can go ahead and, and, and jump back if you're willing. Okay. Um, so now you're fresh out of uh, grad school, you have your PhD, mm -hmm. do you start with the USGS right away? Um, I went to the survey as a postdoc employed by the National Research Council. Mm -hmm. so, so my paycheck said that I was not a survey employee, okay. but I was in residence at the uh, national headquarters back in Reston, Virginia, mm -hmm. and uh, spent uh, three years there um, working with Ian Zen, which was a wonderful experience. And in the course of that time, I was hired by Roland's project, and he then moved us to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, nice. in 1988. Okay. But I spent fall of 85 to the fall of 88 in the D.C. area, uh, mostly stuck in the argon lab, mm. um, learning how to be an isotope geochemist. Well, I thought we were still in the 70s, but I guess not. You did the Ph.D. Oh, in the late 70s? Um, Early I 80s? was a very slow student. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been trying to speed me up, and I, I, I didn't speed up very well. <laughs> um, I have a six-year bachelor's degree, okay. and then uh, took uh, a year off, two years off and um, finished, I think I finished my schooling in 79, but my um, thesis was accepted the spring of 1980 mm -hmm. for my master's. Okay. And then I went back in the fall of 1980 to the University of Washington. I should say, the, the piece in between here, um, I was working for a geothermal exploration firm and they hired me to sit in the Berkeley Library and read 
and I did that throughout the winter. <laughs> and, um, and then come springtime, they were doing drilling in uh, southeastern Oregon mm. in the Albert Desert, mm -hmm. Albert Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. And I went out and sat on, on gradient well holes, uh, which was another education. I guess so. And I had filled up my SF-171 looking for government work also. And um, lo and behold, got a letter saying, we, we got a job for you. And it was a, a summer only job, a temporary job, working in the North Cascades for Art Ford as basically a glorified field assistant. Mm. I had a master's degree, so I was called a geologist. Sure. And I went to my uh, employer and said, I'd like to take uh, a leave of absence for the summer. Um, and go do this, because this is helicopter geology in North Cascades, I can't not do it. Oh and they said, no, this is our high season, we need you. And so I said, okay, I quit. And, and I took the survey job for the summer and also had an application in for graduate school at the University of Washington. So plan B fell into place. Well, I'm sure many heard helicopter geology and their ears perked up a little bit. How, how would that work for a summer? What, how would you operate a um, helicopter? Well, we did it the inefficient way because <laughs> helicopter time is expensive and labor is cheap. Yeah. And I was basically a field assistant to Carl Huey, who was working on uh, collecting samples for what was going to be a master's degree at the University of Montana on the Riddle Peaks layer Gabbro. And we were flown into a camp with our little tent and two weeks of food and dropped off. Mm -hmm. and, and we would, after a week, get moved to someplace else. But we were basically um, on our own. Um, we must have had a radio, but I don't recall using it very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't have to hike into our base camp. Well, without knowing much, that's what I visualize for much of this field work. Like you are solitary or with a, another person and you are in some high country. Yeah, that, that is how we did most of it. Occasionally, in the, the, the luxurious days, um, we would get dropped off in the morning by the helicopter, walk a ridge all day and get picked up in the evening, go back and sleep in a hotel bed. Uh, but that was very, very rare. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's too expensive. And uh, Roland would often bemoaned that there was simply no respect, that in Alaska people did geology that way and, and, and management did not understand the North Cascades are every bit as difficult logistically as Alaska and we should have more helicopter money, but we didn't. <laughs> well, speaking of logistics then, what, what's uh, some memories you have from your field work in the North Cascade at any stage in your career that was the most intense or <sighs> prolonged or people are going to go, wow, really? You were out there for three weeks with um, Well, <laughs> <laughs> what can I think of? Um, Carl Huey and I got tired of eating freeze dries after someone else decided we needed it and said, please, please send us, you know, pounds of cheese and Tabasco sauce. And it came in. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> that um, uh, when you do get dropped off in the morning and picked up in the evening, um, it can be something you fret about a little bit. We didn't have exclusive use of the helicopter. And, and the helicopter belonged first and foremost to um, fire suppression. Sure. And so this time of the year when the wildfire is burning, we could hear the radio traffic and, and will the ship come back at the end of the day? Yeah. Are we gonna have to eat that last candy bar and huddle under a tree all night, right. <laughs> a subalpine fur all night long? Right. And th that never happened, but sometimes I worried about it. Huh. Um, or I think of, of a trip that was a you know, week long get dropped off and picked up where we were lucky and, and families could come along. And you know, we'd um, pick up the extra expense personally of, of the carrying the passengers oh. and uh, flying out. And uh, I'm sitting in the passenger seat next to the pilot and uh, it's kind of foggy. And Tony says, well, okay, Ralph, I'll, I'll look for the trees on this side. If you look for the trees on that side, make sure we don't clip one. And we're basically flying from treetop to treetop through the fog. Oh my and, and I feel this hand coming over my shoulder and looking to be held. It's my wife behind me who's not real comfortable with the idea that we're <laughs> out here <laughs> in the void, yes. wondering where the ground is. Uh, well, you were. You were mapping in the void, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and that's kind of what we're learning here as a group, that not only is there some incredible complications in the North Cascades, mm -hmm. but there's different groups with different approaches, some thinking regionally perhaps, others thinking very, very, you know, like they're just mapping a ridge and to hell with everything else. So can you comment on 
your evolving career in the North Cascades, as you learned more and more detail, were you seeing connections that others were not? Or is that more Roland's thing where he's summarizing uh, at the 100,000 scale? No, I think Roland and I were on the same page as far as understanding what the correlations were inside the North Cascades. And we never got to the point of being able to look outside the North Cascades and see what the connections could be regionally. Yeah. And that's something I'd be happy to talk about. Um, Please, let's do it. Um, and this is getting jumping head into the Baja BC story. Right. Um, I have always been sympathetic to the notion that there has been lots of translation along the margin. And um, the Baja BC controversy was central to my career um, from my time as a student until I stopped working in the North Cascades in the mid-90s. Um, and, and very involved with that intellectually and emotionally. Um, and say, I think things have moved probably for two reasons. Um, one is an appreciation of just how much fault rock there is in the North Cascades and, and how much of the fabric of the range speaks to margin parallel translation. Um, and uh, this goes back in some ways to a, a Ned Brown, Peter Mish rivalry where Ned and his students working in the Northwest Cascade system in the San Juans saw lots of evidence. I saw evidence. Mm -hmm. Lots of rocks extended northwest southeast, lots of striations where things have slid past each other northwest southeast, and not much evidence for the, the range normal transport that Peter Mish and his students interpreted. Um, not saying it's not there, but the rocks don't speak to it directly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is that the, the Baha'i BC controversy, to my mind, has been very frustrating because a lot of it has been, my evidence is good, your evidence is bad. And it's not that we, I, your evidence is wrong, but I don't believe in your kind of evidence. Yes. And, and the, the controversy has been paleomagnetists versus field geologists. And that's been really unfortunate, I think. Um, and it comes from a, a a lack of a, on a basic gut level appreciation of, of, of the amount of work that the other party is putting into things. And you know, one of my first experiences in geology was going out with Merle and running a chainsaw and making little, little round pieces of rock out of an outcrop. And, and uh, you know, paleomagnetism is a real thing. I did it. And, and so there's something there. And I accepted that evidence uh, in ways that my uh, geologist colleagues did not because they lacked the personal experience. Mm. Um, the other, on the other side, something that I think is underappreciated is that geologic, geologic mapping works because we assume continuity. Um, and I don't know how much your listeners think about you know, the principles of geology, mm -hmm. but when I was a freshman in Ned Brown's physical geology class, my textbook talked about Steno's laws. Um, primary hor original horizontality, primary lateral continuity, and superposition. And nothing says you know, that things are stuck together there, but primary lateral continuity says basically the world fits together. Yeah. And um, when you are mapping at a quadrangle scale, at a hillside scale, whatever your scale is, every time you cross a gully, the rocks change a little bit. And you are constantly asking yourself, is this a facies change or is there a fault here? Mm -hmm. And as a field geologist, you have tools for answering that question. Does this map area fit together better if I invoke a facies change or if I say things are shifted a little bit. If I shift them, to, if I see the pattern. And that works really well when the displacements are inside your map area. Mm -hmm. If the displacements are outside your map area, you don't have the intellectual tools to judge them. And nobody who's worked in the Cordillera has had a map area big enough to address the Baja BC question. And at, at one point, and unfortunately it was after I moved out of the North Cascades and no longer had funding to work on these, I had ambitions to, well, let's make a map that addresses this. But, but you need a map area that goes from Nicaragua to Nome. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, to basically ask, does, does BC fit better here or someplace far to the south? Um, the other thing that you need to do when thinking about this is, is make a map that shows you where you can look for late Cretaceous, early tertiary faults and where you can't. And basically, you need to make an honest map that shows this is covered and I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Only the cover isn't just glacial drift and alluvium and marsh deposits. It's the Columbia Plateau basalts. It's the Eocene basin fills. Mm -hmm. It's the latest Cretaceous and tertiary metamorphism. 
and a map of the Cordillera that shows where you can't tell if there's a fault there or not is going to have little islands of coherent geology surrounded by vast amounts of stuff that's unknown because of co covered by younger rocks or metamorphism. Great stuff there. Thank you for that. Did you feel like you were kind of on a fence between the, the world of Merle and the world of these bedrock people who didn't respect Merle's work? Or did you not really put yourself in that position? I didn't feel like I was on the fence. I mean, I, and I think Merle said this well, there wasn't that much animosity. I mean, that we're, we're, we're all colleagues and we're all friends yeah. and we're arguing for something we care about. Yes. But, and the argument helps us do better science. Yeah. I mean, the, the conflict, the disagreement is a motor to do more things and think harder about stuff. And, 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 you know, I don't feel, yeah. didn't feel pulled or conflicted at all that way. Now, what's your relationship with Daryl Cowan? We spent a fair amount of time with him. Was he on your committee as well, and did he help train you? Daryl was my PhD supervisor. He signed my thesis uh, dissertation um, on my committee. Um, thinking about this the other day, you know, who have I learned geology from, and what did I learn? And... Um, you know, I think probably the, the, the most important of my mentors have been Roland and Ian Zen and Daryl. And what I've learned most of all from all of them is it pays to work really hard. I mean, the, the doing good science is really hard work mm -hmm. and, and you get results from it. I'm, I'm not sure I've lived up to that, but yes, uh, you, <laughs> uh, you know, watching how hard Daryl worked, yeah. watching how hard Ian worked, watching how hard Roland worked. How about a little more on Roland? I don't know. I've never met Roland. Is he still with us? Yes. And, yeah. and uh, you guys were kind of a team, at least in print, you guys are a team. I, working with Roland is wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, Roland is, is very good at what he does. He's very human, um, a delightful person, um, strong mountaineer. Uh -huh. uh, I consider him a, a good friend. Um, he's still with us. He's living in the sequoias outside of uh, Menlo Park, mm -hmm. uh, about within a couple hundred yards of San Andreas Fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I mentioned you guys are a team. So here's one of your famous publications that came out in 1999, I believe. Mm -hmm. What was the motivation to put this together with the Mountaineers? Roland has always, I'm not sure if he feels an obligation or likes, but understood that part of his job is explaining the earth to everyone. And popular geology is part of geology. And so his book on the Olympics is, is important mm -hmm. and, and well-loved. And he wanted the North, an Earth Cascades book for some time. Um, I realized, can we take a break and I can go grab one more book you of Roland's? Absolutely, yep. There's also what, what turned me on is this regional story and being able to lump a few ideas here and there without diluting uh, what's out there. Because as you heard, if, if we're trying to deal with what did you say? Something to Nome? Nicaragua to Nome? I like that. <laughs> I mean, we, we can't be too far in the weeds or we're not going to get anywhere. And so this kind of connection, uh, this sweet spot between the gory little details and something too broad that's not going to do justice to this is what we want. So you re you've got another uh, famous Roland uh, publication, yeah. also from the Mountaineers. Oh, sure. And I don't know if I learned about this book in high school or as an undergraduate, but this is, this book is something I've aspired to, to ever since I knew about it. And this is Peter Mish's copy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's a wonderful book. I recommend to anybody who loves the North Cascades. Mm -hmm. um, and this was uh, written by Dwight Crowder and, and Roland. Okay. And uh, Dwight was a colleague, I think a little bit older than Roland, and helped bring him bring Roland into the survey. Um, and it's it's a it's not a geologic book. It, it's a go explore them. It's it's a route book. Yes. For mountaineers. Yes. Um, telling geology along the way. Mm -hmm. Well, kind of like uh, 
Fred Becky. I mean, that's that's a whole nother. Yeah. Okay. And um, what I understand from Roland is he had um, been collecting uh, notes on this and was headed towards a second edition. Oh. And um, that I'm not sure when that would have been, but uh, probably earlier mid '70s. Mm -hmm. And the Mountaineers um, Publications Committee was having self-doubt about publishing guidebooks because it brought too many people into the mountains. Mm. And um, there was a decision made to not print a second edition of this. Oh, and Roland apparently lost friends over that. Oh, and boy. it was a painful experience. And because of that, there's no, there are no directions in here, no routes. Oh. This book does not say, go on this hike and see these things. Because of that Because problem. of that experience. Roland won't, wouldn't publish a guidebook. Ah. Which I have some regrets about because if you if you connect the dots in here, there are some delightful trips you can do. Yeah. They say go on this day hike and see these yeah. things, um, and see the mountains. Um, and not to steer you too much, but no blatant discussion of Baja BC in any of these publications. Um, Is that a conscious choice? No. Um, it was, I think, a sense that, that, that that's outside of the scope of things that are internal to the North Cascades. That, that's a question you don't address inside the North Cascades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, there are big faults out there. And um, how important they are, which ones are the biggest ones, that's a good question. How about just a bit more on Baja BC, and then we'll go back to a little bit of this. You doing okay, by the way? Yeah, I'm okay. fine. Um, with your personal history with Merle back in the early 70s, you, mm -hmm. you've kind of kept your eyes and ears open to anyone talking about Baja BC over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Field conferences, field trips, mm -hmm. books, maps, etc. Have you become more and more interested in Baja BC through the years? Did you agree with Daryl that it was kind of fading from discussion like that was his motivation in the late 90s was just to kind of remind people that this was a thing mm -hmm. how would you kind of reflect back on your interaction with Baja BC over the last 50 years I think Baja BC has faded from the discussion it's certainly faded from my consciousness and um, you know, I, I, I can't tell you what all the pieces are of why that's happened. Some of it's because the problem has turned out to be more, less tractable than we thought it was. Um, less what? Tractable. Oh. Um, that uh, the paleomagnetic evidence has not been as clear cut as we would like. The zircon evidence that would, in the late 90s we thought would be the thing, right. has also proved to be ambiguous. Um, that we just don't know. We're not able to get definitive answers as we'd like to get. On a, on a personal side, um, my funding and support changed in the mid-1990s, and I moved from doing bedrock geology in, in old rocks in North Cascades to um, doing earthquake hazards geology in glacial deposits in the Puget Lowland. And then I discovered LIDAR, which is a whole other diversion and scratches a lot of my itches, and, and, and um, I simply haven't had the emotional energy or the time or the support, the direction, to work on Baja BC questions. Um, I say the, the last time I thought hard about Baha'i BC was in 1999 at a Penrose conference that was held in the Metau Valley in Winthrop um, on terrain translation in the Cordillera. And at, that's the point I realized that, that the, the answer for me would be to make a map of the Cordillera. Mm. And that that was not something I was going to do. Mm -hmm. That I would not have the resources to do that. And I probably, and, and that's not just financial, it's I think I probably don't know how to handle that much stratigraphy, yeah. how to think about it. So even though we're 20 years uh, away from you thinking hard about this, um, could you comment briefly on the ambiguities that, that you remember or think still exist with both Paleomag and Zircon? Why isn't that quite the smoking gun that some thought it might be? With the Paleomag, there have been, there, there are fundamental questions about paleo latitude. In embedded in rocks, um, there is a phenomenon called inclination flattening. That, that may or may not be real, mm -hmm. but people suggest it could be real enough we should worry about it, mm -hmm. that, that some rocks may give us anomalously shallow directions, which makes them look like they've been translated to the north, and they haven't been. Um, there are also questions about the age of the remnants that can be hard to answer. Um, Merle pointed out that there's a fold test we can do 
but sometimes the fold test doesn't give clear answers. Sometimes you don't know what the age of folding is. Uh, th th there are problems there. In, in plutonic rocks, um, the tonalites, the Mount Stewart and the Spuzzum and other plutons that given the best paleomagnetic data, um, the question of how the plutons been tilted is a very real question. And um, lots of people have tried to work on bathymetry, or sorry, paleobarometry of the plutons yeah. to get at the tilt question. And Merle talked about this. Yeah. Um, that's a, a hard thing to do because you oftentimes don't have the buffering mineral assemblages to give you good pressures. You also can't easily judge whether there's mineralogic equilibrium to the pressures are meaningful, the apparent pressures. And the bigger problem, I was a TA for Daryl teaching field geology at the University of Washington in the early 80s, and Daryl took us all to um, Bear Mountain outside of Beatty, Nevada, uh, near the Nevada test site. And I can recall, I think it's US 95, it goes down the west side of the test site, looking up and looking at the ridge crest and seeing the uh, Bonanza King formation, which is, I believe, of earliest Cambrian age, and you could see it was all Bonanza King. And if it wasn't for the fact that, that the rocks are striped, you could look up and see they had done this. You wouldn't know they were standing on end. It was all the same rocks. And then a pluton without stripes, you can't tell if it's done that or not. And that kind of deformation, sort of bookend, books collapsing on a shelf, is, is fairly common. And it would be a very easy way to get the wrong paleo latitude out of a plutonic rock. And um, we don't have enough places where there are bedded rocks sitting on top of the plutons that we can look at to see how they've been tilted like that or not. And the zircon, why aren't those clear-cut in, <sighs> in your view? Seems this like a pretty, I mean, you bring these zircons from rivers, you deposit them on a terrain, I mean. The, 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 I think there are two issues. One is that um, some of the initial zircon work has been done looking at, say, look at this population, it looks like that one, they match. and. This looks like that is a very hard thing to uh, quantify. Mm. To, you know, what does it mean that it looks like that? It doesn't everything look the, look the same if you close your eyes and get blurry enough? <laughs> um, and you need to instead say, this can't be that, it looks different. And, and not enough of that kind of work has been done. Mm. Um, the other issue is, is those rivers. And there are plenty of places in the world where rivers flow the lengths of mountain ranges. Um, you know, the Yukon, um, the Columbia does that. Um, and uh, there has been hypothesized there's been a quite a bit of latitudinal transport of zircons by rivers in the past, and, and that's a real issue, mm -hmm. and we need better paleogeography mm -hmm. to know where the zircons were moving back in the late Cretaceous. How about a few final comments on the North Cascades, and then I'd be happy to look at a couple things you've got coming out more recently, if you're, if you're sure. comfortable with that. So when you talk about the North Cascades, just in Washington, to a general audience, mm -hmm. how do you decide how to deliver your message? How many terrains do you end up with? Do you, are you a fan of lumping versus splitting? Is it, what's, the, what's the sweet spot for communicating the complexity? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's that complicated, it's hard to even comment on that. I well, mean, I'm, I'm going to not answer your question. Yeah. Um, for me, and, and part of this is what I've been working on since I worked in the North Cascades. Um, when I want to talk about the North Cascades, um, I want to start from the top down, from the youngest to the older stuff. And so, you know, why is there a mountain range there? And so I want to talk about subduction off the coast right now in the modern magmatic arc. I want to talk about the Yakima Fold Belt. I mean, the highest peaks in the Cascades are where the parts of the Yakima Fold Belt intersect the arc. You know, th there's a, an uplift a line that goes from Mount Stewart to Three Fingers to the San Juan Islands. Interesting. Um, th that happens to be the crest of, of, of the, the, the big Nanum Ridge Fold. Really? I never thought about that. You don't? <laughs> <laughs> but Nick, you live on it. <laughs> I do. No, seriously. I mean, and, and if we could stand up and look at it, we, we, we'd see the, the east end of Nanum Ridge, jump off ridge yeah. there, and that high ground goes to Mount Stewart, goes to Three Fingers and Whitehorse, and goes to the San Juan Islands. And that uplifting part is clearly post-CRB. Um, so that start there and go down. Yes. Um, the, the next thing, 
And, and this would be my one piece of wisdom about the North Cascades. Um, for my comprehensive exams as a PhD student at the University of Washington, I was asked to write about the Mesozoic geology of the North Cascades. And my answer was most of it's Eocene. And I think we still don't appreciate how much of the geometry of the range is actually early tertiary. And, and my major intellectual contribution to, and I'm not sure where the figure is in here, uh, to North Cascades geology, I think. And I'm not going to find it in there. Um, okay. And it. We got time. Let me. I got the big map rolled up if you want. Well, uh, I want to find the correlation diagram, which may not be on in here. Oh, is it? I mean, I'm a big fan of this one. This is from the mid 90s, but I thought what you did there was amazing. Yeah. Is that it's these column heads. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them domains here in the um, North Cascades map. They're blocks, but the Wenatchee block, the Chelan block, the Metau block, the Northwest Cascade system is a block. Those are, are, are Eocene blocks. They're bounded by Eocene faults. They're places where, in some places, we see Eocene bedded rocks, so they went down in the Eocene. Other places, we see Eocene cooling ages of mid crustal rocks that have come up. Um, and if we go into the large parts of the, the Skagit core, um, the dominant fabric is a, a northwest-southeast Eocene elongation. And um, to go back to the Cretaceous, to the, the time of terrains, right. um, or the Jurassic, um, we have to see through uh, all of the Eocene overprint. There's a lot to remove before yeah. you get to the... And, and this is something actually that I probably first learned from Scott Babcock, who was another Peter Mish student who taught at Western, and I took a couple courses from, and uh, and he sort of remarked flippantly in passing um, that that trying to figure out the Cretaceous of, of the Skagit core was stupid when we can't even figure out the Eocene. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's encouraging. I think there's a couple new uh, major projects to focus on the Eocene in the North Cascades. Mike Eddy in particular, mm -hmm. and. and yeah, that. yeah, and, and I'm very much a fan of Mike's work, and I'm trying to add my little bit to it as well. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, okay, I lied. I want to do one more with the terrains. Okay. Uh, just thinking of, of all the well-known and less lesser-known terrains and just locations and rocks within the North Cascades, are there a few favorites of yours, meaning they're, they're, they're particularly instructive, or the rock's beautiful, or, or we know the most about a couple of these things and they help? Like if, if we're just mired in uncertainty and we just we want to just hang our hat on a few terrains and, and feel great about what we're looking at, would, would, you, would two or three come to mind as particularly you're shaking your head. <laughs> I'm not a good son. No, no. I, I, my idea of rocks I, I, I really like are, are, you know, this pretty rock, this hand specimen, I yeah. like it. Um, yeah. and, and the terrains, I, I don't have any emotional involvement mm -hmm. with to speak at any consequence. The, the thing I think of about terrains, the, the piece of the North Cascades terrain story that sticks in my mind um, is that we have several terrains that, that sound a lot, a lot like each other. The Hosamine group. Um, the Napiqua terrain, um, the, uh, the Bell Pass Melange, which is mostly Elbow Lake, or we go out into the San Juans and it's the Orcas Chert and the um, associated uh, uh, Seamount Volcanics. Mm -hmm. And those are all um, oceanic terrains. And we could say they're all the same one, and, and there's some truth in that. But what we're saying is that it's pieces of the Paleozoic and early Mesozoic Pacific Ocean floor. And look at the modern Pacific Ocean and how big a place that is. And yes. think about how meaningful it is to say this is all the same terrain. It's not very. Right. Right. And, and, and even doing the best stratigraphy we can uh, through the mangling, through the metamorphism, um, we're not going to be able to subdivide those in useful ways to tell us how far things have moved mm -hmm. in between, say, the the Hosamine, the Napiqua, and the Elbow Lake. Mm -hmm. It's a tough problem. Yes. Is there hope? Like what? Yeah, like hope's what? a nice place on the Fraser River Canyon <laughs> where there's a bakery and a couple of bars. Yeah. And <laughs>
in the Canyon Cafe is, that has uh, Canadian Chinese food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like if you were 20 years younger and you had full funding and they said you got more work to do in the North Cascades, picking up on what you left off in the mid-90s, would it be that regional entire Cordilleran thing or would you be able to do some things in the North Cascades that would give us a leap or two ahead? I think there are things in the North Cascades you could do and the Tridal Zircon work is one of them and I'd be happy to have someone else do that. Mm -hmm. um, if I were 20 years younger and someone said, here's money, um, I would go to the Blue Mountains Interesting. Um, where I think there are North Cascades rocks and you know, can I go recognize old friends there? And, and I would think about, um, think long and hard about do I have the wherewithal to tackle the, the Nicaragua, Nicaragua to Nome project. Right. And, and that would be the support uh, financially and do we have the intellectual tools to deal with that much stratigraphy? Actually, and I don't know the answer to those questions. Right, you know, right. Um, you can help me actually right now. I'm struggling currently with if there's North Cascades rocks in the Blue Mountains. Mm -hmm. Do we need offset between those two units or can it just be a ribbon of stuff that happened to be plastered on at different latitudes? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't... I don't, know how to, I don't know how excited to get when somebody says, oh yeah, you were up in the upper Tiana way and that's the same serpentinite that we have down here in the, the Klamath. And I'm like, part of me wants to go, well, great, let's, let's, let's get a strike slip fault in here and offset this stuff. And the other part says... Yeah. And I think the answer is going to be, can we get good paleo latitudes out of the early Cretaceous? How do you get paleo latitudes without paleo mag? Um, Paleomag is probably the best choice, but um, if we had a better understanding of the biostratigraphy and the, the faunal limitations, we can read latitudes out of shells to some extent. Hmm. And the other one is, again, get our paleogeography that we don't have to know uh, where the zircons came from and how they moved, and then use the tridal zircon work to mm -hmm. get paleo latitude. Mm -hmm. um, but that's going to be a tough thing to do. Hope you enjoyed that visit with Ralph. I certainly did. Hope you learned a few things along the way about North Cascade geology and even some younger geology and future projects that Ralph has in mind. I love you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time and goodbye.